Hey guys and gals, welcome back to the Conscious Consumer Podcast, where we strive to help you thrive spiritually, mentally, physically, and financially in the digital age. Conscious consumption is essentially integrative health, incorporating how mind, body, and spirit are interconnected and impact our overall health. It's the understanding of how the things we consume, food and drinks, media, and resources, and the thoughts and beliefs that consume us all contribute to our overall well-being and the well-being of society as a whole. It's taking cues about what we need to be happy, feel fulfilled, and prosper from our inner pilot light or intuition and the natural world around us rather than material possessions or societal approval. It's the belief that everything is interconnected and the awareness of how our actions, intentions, and values as individuals and consumers affect someone on the other side of the globe we don't even know exists. It's the appreciation for strong community and how the sense of belonging to a tribe helps us prosper. It's the belief in the power of sustainability and local solutions over industrial approaches. It's the celebration of the DIY spirit and about making and spending money in a way that has the smallest social footprint. It's the belief in individuality and celebration of personal freedom and freedom of speech, so long as it doesn't affect the freedom and well-being of others. It's the understanding that in order to fix a problem, we must use our inner pilot light to learn and resolve the root cause rather than the symptoms recognizing that problems often stem from a failure to take personal responsibility for and measures to combat our poor decisions. For me, this last principle might hold the most significance of all of them. When I initially wrote it, it was specifically in reference to physical degeneration caused by a poor diet. But after much self-evaluation, I brought in the scope to transcend mere nutrition. Unbeknownst to me, lack of meaning and significance in my life was creating discontent, especially because I had set the expectation that I would do something significant with my life, making an impact on human suffering. The unfulfillment of my lofty goals, those which 99.99% of humans don't achieve, was creating disconnect. If I had to trace it back to one specific time, It was when I left my job and home in Chicago, where I had a more balanced life and felt significant, and moved to Mexico. It wasn't that I was unhappy in the new environment, it was more the fact that I lived alone, had no full-time gig, and didn't have the opportunities for leisure I had in the big city. I was relatively self-isolated and lacked the sense of belonging to at least one tribe that I had had in Chicago. Thus, with so much time being solo, my main concern, and I do mean concern, became myself. I continued living alone for several years after, and my situation continued to deteriorate. The longer I was alone with my mind, the more self-awareness shifted to self-consciousness. I always thought this term was a measure of self-esteem, but it really is defined as an overabundant amount of negative self-reflection and rumination. Thus, it wasn't surprising to find this preoccupation also inflated my own self-importance. My self-absorption revolved around what I was going to will in my life instead of doing what was needed around me and giving careful consideration to what I was going to eat for my next meal instead of what independent restaurant or food vendor I could support. For example, I always toiled with what I was going to start with to optimize my nutritional psychiatry and minimize insulin resistance instead of being grateful to just have food in the first place. I started living for me and my daily concerns, abandoning my morals and my sense of purpose along the way, doing things I always told myself I would never do such as investing in Costco stock and patronizing Amazon. I was always thinking and came to realize it was always ever only about myself. How I needed to dress for the weather, or if I needed to pull an avocado out of the fridge to ripen for the next day. 
But this overconsideration and fixation with self-importance weren't the only things causing tension. It also came from lack of action, particularly progression towards my goals, which also was the catalyst for the other issues. I thought if I stopped neglecting my health, things like drinking, eating processed foods, and sleep deprivation, I would get better. But no improvement came because I wasn't working on myself and strengthening my abilities on more than a superficial level. I wasn't creating value in the world or benefiting humankind. But that was something I was oblivious to. I was still friendly to others and would do what I could to help them out. But deep down, my heart was telling me I needed to make a more significant impact. I just wasn't listening to it. It's permissible to not work towards your ultimate concern your reason for being, when you're not aware of it. The best way to bring it into your consciousness is through mindfulness. Being present to your experience, recognizing your thoughts, and letting them come and go without trying to control or manipulate them. The process is in stark contrast to a concentrative meditation, like practicing a mantra, in which the practitioner focuses on one particular aspect of their experience and tries to consciously control it, instead of objectively feeling or looking at the entirety of their present experience. With concentrative meditation, there is always a motive and object of focus. There are definitely benefits to this type of meditation practice, like improved focus and all the health benefits that come with calming down the nervous system. However, generally it doesn't allow you to peel back the layers of your mind and evaluate your suffering. In fact, The goal is largely trying to purge difficult negative emotions or desires from the mind by refocusing it. In the particular case of painful emotions, I would try to supplant them with more pleasant ones. By doing this, you disrupt your brain's tendency to have those conditioned responses. Or so goes the logic. Here's a quote from meditation expert Michael Singer that illustrates it eloquently. People get too involved in the vibrations they like and the vibrations they don't like. Instead of just letting it come and go, they sit there and say, I don't like this. I don't like when it comes into me. Therefore, I don't want it coming into me. I don't like what it feels like, so I don't want it to happen. End quote. The goal here is the avoidance of pain, and in order to prevent it, you become just as reactive. There's no buffer between the stimulus and the response, no attempt to resolve it. So ultimately, those same negative mental formations still have their fangs in you despite the adaptation. But with mindfulness meditation, you let your thoughts arise and dissolve. At first, you become conscious of your mind. Even nascent mindfulness practitioners have this ability. However, they actively opt not to progress to the next level when they choose to rid the mind of the things that cause them pain. On the other hand, those who are non-judgmental and controlling of their thoughts and experience eventually become conscious of their sense of self, i.e. self-aware. Also known as metacognition, self-awareness is the ability to understand the patterns behind your thought processes in addition to merely recognizing them. Here's more of Singer's take. So now you're in a good position. You're now at the root of the mind. What you're going to see every single time is that the reason your mind talks is it's trying to solve that problem of why you're not okay. And eventually when you get clear enough, you can sit with your problems. Clear means I see I'm not okay and that's okay. It's okay that I'm not okay. End quote. So instead of beating your suffering back into submission in your store consciousness, sit with it. The idea is that when you notice a negative emotion or your thoughts drifting, don't try to avoid it. Instead of getting frustrated or judgmental and purging the thought, emotion, or image from your mind, embrace it and see it through. By becoming conscious of my consciousness, I was able to recognize the the disdain I had for my circumstance. I gained the insight that I couldn't be alone with myself, becoming anxious and sad whenever whatever stimulus I was engaging with was about to come to a close. Instead of stillness, my mind would jump to the next thing in anticipation, entirely glossing over the present. 
This was a profound start on the path towards the recognition of the root of my suffering. And as I continued to not push back against the pain, the band-aid slowly began to peel off the wound. Instead of objectively feeling or looking at the entirety of their present experience. With concentrative meditation, there is always a motive and object of focus. There are definitely benefits to this type of meditation practice, like improved focus and all the health benefits that come with calming down the nervous system. However, generally it doesn't allow you to peel back the layers of your mind and evaluate your suffering. In fact, the goal is largely trying to purge difficult negative emotions or desires from the mind by refocusing it. In the particular case of painful emotions, I would try to supplant them with more pleasant ones. By doing this, you disrupt your brain's tendency to have those conditioned responses. Or so goes the logic. Here's a quote from meditation expert Michael Singer that illustrates it eloquently. People get too involved in the vibrations they like and the vibrations they don't like. Instead of just letting it come and go, they sit there and say, I don't like this. I don't like when it comes into me. Therefore, I don't want it coming into me. I don't like what it feels like, so I don't want it to happen. End quote. The goal here is the avoidance of pain, and in order to prevent it, you become just as reactive. There's no buffer between the stimulus and the response, no attempt to resolve it. So ultimately, those same negative mental formations still have their fangs in you despite the adaptation. But with mindfulness meditation, you let your thoughts arise and dissolve. At first, you become conscious of your mind. Even nascent mindfulness practitioners have this ability. However, they actively opt not to progress to the next level when they choose to rid the mind of the things that cause them pain. On the other hand, those who are non-judgmental and controlling of their thoughts and experience eventually become conscious of their sense of self, i.e. self-aware. Also known as metacognition, self-awareness is the ability to understand the patterns behind your thought processes in addition to merely recognizing them. Here's more of Singer's take. So now you're in a good position. You're at now at the root of the mind. What you're going to see every single time is that the reason your mind talks is it's trying to solve that problem of why you're not okay. And eventually when you get clear enough, you can sit with your problems. Clear means, I see I'm not okay and that's okay. It's okay that I'm not okay. End quote. So instead of beating your suffering back into submission in your store consciousness, in other words, your subconscious, sit with it. The idea is that when you notice a negative emotion or your thoughts drifting, don't try to avoid it. Instead of getting frustrated or judgmental and purging the thought, emotion, or image from your mind, embrace it and see it through. By becoming conscious of my consciousness, I was able to recognize the disdain I had for my circumstance. I gained the insight that I couldn't be alone with myself, becoming anxious and sad whenever whatever stimulus I was engaging with was about to come to a close. Instead of stillness, my mind would jump to the next thing in anticipation, entirely glossing over the present. This was a profound start on the path towards the recognition of the root of my suffering. And as I continued to not push back against the pain, the band-aid slowly began to peel off the wound. When I found my mind gravitating towards a scheduled vacation five months down the road, for example, I meditated on my mind and reflected. What was lacking in my current experience that had me craving more or living for the future or past? And what could I do to manifest that thing? But once you do that, and you finally realize where your discontent is coming from and how to alleviate it, it's time to act. Maybe I hadn't meditated enough to reach pure consciousness, free of desire, if that is even a thing. That debate in itself could be a topic for an entirely different episode. In my case, I had reflected enough to gain insight into what I needed to do to feel significant. For example, create value in the world through art. But I still wasn't acting on it. 
I would rationalize my inaction by nitpicking external conditions that were preventing me from taking initiative. For example, of course I couldn't record vocals or voiceovers when there was a background TV noise from the apartment upstairs. Or obviously, I couldn't write when I was a bit sleep deprived or record a TikTok when I didn't look particularly photogenic. And since these are all tasks I thought would fulfill my soul's desire, I would get a bit of dopamine boost when I accomplished them. But on the other hand, I would sink much deeper when I failed to do so, which happened much more often than the former. However, in order to bring myself back up, I told myself that once the environment was ripe for the taking, I would act without delay. Sure, there were some days I had little time to accomplish each of my non-negotiables, the daily action steps that brought me solace, especially after moving back in with my parents for a spell. Things like creative writing, active mindfulness meditation, and practicing piano or singing. I affirmed that the change of scenery by moving back into my childhood home was just the reset I needed to get out of my head and back on track. But the joke was on me, as my conduct failed to improve. I certainly had less time and space for a secluded, concerted effort in this new setting, but if they really were so important to me, I should have been able to break away and dedicate a bit of time alone to full immersion in a few of these most cherished pastimes. I needed to stop placing blame on others for my lack of activity. From this experience, I learned firsthand that if you wait until all the conditions of your life are arranged perfectly, you may never end up acting on the things that your soul needs and forever feel inadequate. In a similar sense, If you can't find a way to carve out time for the things you're telling yourself are the most vital, maybe you're not really about that life in the first place, and it would better serve you to let go of those expectations entirely. Goals that are materialistic or egotistical in origin, as opposed to spiritual, often lack the incentive to inspire action, and when they go unrealized or even unpursued, create a discrepancy between the real self and the ideal self. Every expectation or personal obligation is just one more thing that can get trapped inside and cause tension. They keep you from being present, letting the experience unfold, and relaxing through it. The same thing applies to clinging to past experiences. Good luck enjoying the moment unfolding before you when you're comparing it to a majestic past experience you're stuck on. Eventually, I gained the insight that I had been taking my identity from what I had done in the past, my job and my persona, a DJ and graphic producer, and what I told myself I would do in the future, be a rapper and musician and social commenter, rather than the person I was in the present. In essence, my personality, disposition, and preferences. The innate, imminent human qualities. And when those circumstances ceased to exist or failed to materialize, I felt out of sorts, depressed even. I was deriving my self-identity from external conditions instead of just doing what brought me internal validation and not worrying about my surrounding life circumstance. If I had handled the pivotal things, I could have been at peace inside regardless of if the world was crumbling around me. I would have served myself much better if I had focused on building my skill set a bit each day, instead of fantasizing about the situations I would use those abilities in five years down the road. Maybe lack of pursuit was because I feared failure. Or maybe deep down, I didn't really want the life I told myself I did on a more superficial, egotistical level. But regardless, because I was still attached to and not chasing after it, I experienced a lot of psychological distress. Since I wasn't finding value inside myself, worldly attachments slowly gained significance. During the stretch I was without a regular income, I became obsessed with preservation of self and my possessions, like my iPhone, and brand new MacBook Pro, in conservation of things like razors and dish soap, just to save a few dollars, even over the course of several months. 
The infatuation became so intense that activities traditionally thought of as relaxing, like eating or taking a hot shower, became stressful instead of comforting. I became stingy with money, a quality I had always loathed. I was always keeping an exact balance of what friends owed me and still tipped service workers and offered up spare change, but would rationalize giving less than I could afford. I don't even want to know how much of my time I spent thinking about money. I also can only shake my head at how much energy I devoted to my appearance, mostly my hair. I was constantly thinking about my hair falling out, which it was in clumps, or trying to figure out if my teeth were any more crooked that morning after grinding them from angst during the night. Ironically, if I wouldn't have been stressing over these cosmetic issues, they probably wouldn't have presented themselves. The power of the body to manifest what the mind believes is a remarkable human quality, but again, there's enough on that topic for a future episode. My other main fixation, as I mentioned, was with food. Things like taste, having the perfectly cooked, still warm eggs, or the exact coffee to cream ratio. Also, my nutrition was of the most importance. Things like protein timing, protein to carb ratio, and avoiding anti-nutrients and pesticides. Finally, my last fixation was on conservation and rationing of food, so much to the point that sometimes what I was hoarding would spoil before I decided to eat it. Attachment leads to, to desire, and desire gives birth to anger. My food addiction got so bad that I became possessive and angry when my roommates ate things I had been coveting. Again, I was getting pleasure from my self-centered indulgences instead of satisfaction from seeing others get enjoyment out of something. Somewhere along the way, I became ashamed of my conduct and would try to hide my poor habits from my roommates. It even became tough to look them in the face when I was indulging in food, filling my drink, or smelled of cigarettes. I got the sense that the feeling was reciprocal. I was never at peace or content always worrying about the future or craving more of the past, and really never had a moment of mental stillness to rehabilitate myself. You could see this inner turmoil on my face, so much that my parents didn't want to look me in it. Lacking a sense of perspective, I needed to have certain conditions in my life. For example, I would tell myself I, quote, needed a cup of coffee to sit down and take the initiative to write or that I needed food to accompany consuming media or an alcoholic beverage while snacking. I was letting substances control me instead of me controlling my circumstance. Eventually, the escapism and dopamine stacking got to the point where I needed to be consuming stimuli simultaneously. For example, listening to music while smoking or eating while listening to a podcast or watching YouTube or sports. If there was a break in the action, for example, a commercial, I would pause taking bites in order to be able to indulge in both the entertainment and the food simultaneously. During the break, my brain would anticipate the next bite instead of using it as a pause to be alone with the mind and reflect on how out of balance and pathetic my life had become. Often, I would save a little bit of each meal component to combine in the last bite. Not sure if this is extreme dopamine stacking or mild OCD. Maybe you can tell me. Embarrassingly to admit, because I was only getting pleasure from food and entertainment, not enjoyment from what I was doing, there were times when I couldn't seriously focus on a, quote, difficult task for more than a few seconds without getting distracted by the thought of various types of rapid-fire stimulation. It became so bad that I couldn't even enjoy the vices I had, those which other people typically use to escape their troubles. Instead of smoking, drinking, or eating mindfully and enjoying the indulgence, my mind was elsewhere, often on what was coming next. You know it's an addiction when you continue to do it despite not bringing temporarily relief from the suffering, overthinking. It was to the point where my sympathetic response, the rest and digest mode, wouldn't kick on until there was nothing else I could be searching for. In essence, when I had decided I wasn't going to eat or drink anything else for the night. 
after eating, food often made me feel empty and cheap, never meeting my dopamine expectation. On top of that, I would feel guilty because I didn't feel I had taken enough action to justify that reward. The same applied with entertainment. I felt unworthy of watching it during the day because I wasn't where I wanted to be professionally. At least with sports I felt gratified, though I knew it was superficial and derivative and fleeting, but the letdown of a loss hurt that much worse. Though I was living in a developing world country, I was so wrapped up in myself that the daily dose of perspective I received by witnessing the people around me quickly faded. I would realize but quickly forget how lucky I was that the most prominent stressors I had were these trivial choices in everyday life. Like, for example, what condiment I was going to smear on my bagel or ensuring I had enough protein before eating it, instead of so many around the world who would be ecstatic to even have the option of a condiment on their breakfast roll. Despite having near the bare minimum, impoverished individuals and families I've witnessed often seem to be happy and grateful for whatever life has brought them. They seem to be content as long as they are getting by and have little desire for more. They work hard for what they have and take pride in attaining it. The choices they face are often made for them, dictated by their challenging life circumstance. One huge key takeaway I discovered as I reflected on those past experiences and became more conscious of my thought process was that the less options I have, the happier I become. Simplicity means less accounting for and thus less wasted time and energy. Ultimately, it equates to less stress from worrying about maintaining your possessions or constantly being in decision-making mode. An overabundance of options and considerations and the overimportance I placed on each decision, often leading to more wasted time spent in regret, had me constantly in task-switching mode, causing tension and forgetfulness and also preventing me from getting down to business on the things that give me purpose. Due to the sheer volume of things I told myself I needed to accomplish each day, another fixation was with down-to-the-quarter-hour scheduling. It was funny because I would segment out each day, but it never went according to schedule since I always gave the little things too much consideration, making them take longer than I anticipated, even though I should have known better because that was always the case. I was constantly evaluating what I was doing or going to do, eat, listen to, or work on, against all the possible options of what I could be doing, weighing my opportunity costs. I had become a maximalist, much to the disappointment of my minimalist ideals. Every day I felt like I was racing against the clock to handle my daily concerns, the little things I was convinced I had to do for my health or financial preservation. And because I devoted so much energy and thus time to these lesser things on my to-do list, I would scramble frantically at the end of the day to accomplish the pivotal ones, my non-negotiables. As a result, my attention would be divided during the task, preventing me from getting into the flow state and optimizing my development. In retrospect, all the time and energy I could have been devoting to my ultimate concern was spent mulling frivolous decisions about my day-to-day activities. The ironic thing is that, if I were to focus on the ultimate, the other things would have resolved themselves. Or at the very least, I wouldn't have grappled with them to the degree I had or been remorseful if I made the, quote, wrong decision. For example, vaped more than three puffs I usually allotted for myself, or chose the entree while out to eat for dinner that left me wondering if the other would have been better. These material choices I toiled over, which usually became negligible the next day, wouldn't have been my only source of fulfillment and thus wouldn't have carried the weight they did. When you're internally validated, you aren't always craving more, bigger, and better, and no longer rely on your appearance to feel good about yourself. In fact, when you can take solace in the effort exuded and personal development, you value who you are, not what you are or what you have. All the fickle things seem less important or fall by the wayside entirely. Now that I've had this realization, I'm not always looking to enhance my experience with something more. 
Just the growth from or wonder of the experience is rewarding enough. In the past, I found pleasure in the reward that came after the task instead of enjoyment from the process. You can't be truly at peace, joyful, and fulfilled if you don't know the reason you are here, or at least appreciate the wonder of life. When you've pinpointed who you are and the deepest desire of your heart, traveling down the path towards it becomes enjoyable. Though it's far from effortless, your development is the gratification. The phrase, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, will forever ring true. It's a good sign you're on the right track to finding your reason for being when you can work for hours on end getting in the flow and entirely forgetting about eating or the reward after. A common occurrence with my dad. I have great admiration for the man and wish I loved anything as much as he loves woodworking and carpentry. Although it's traditionally viewed as hard labor, he's able to turn home construction and renovation into his bliss state. It seems like all of these activities are a type of meditation for him, a way to occupy his mind in the present. When I was at the worst point of being stuck in my head, he was probably more of a mindful practitioner than I. And though he may not love it, the yard work that fills the remainder of his days also seems like a source of pride. I remember him telling me once when referring to being a property owner, there's always something to be done. I think the demands of structural and landscape upkeep serve to keep him mentally and physically fit. Because of the way he frames the activity, he's able to take something most people opine to be challenging and turn it into a positive. You can appreciate exerting effort without developmental growth, for example, during tasks I used to dread. If I can be mindful and fully engaged, I find enjoyment even in chores even cleaning the litter box. When I made any of those unfavorable activities my sole focus and took into account the sense of accomplishment they bring, it became a restorative process instead of a stressful one. Maybe there isn't a sense of growth like when, quote, working on my passions, but I certainly feel fulfilled from exerting effort towards something challenging, i.e. an honest day's work. However, you can still benefit from consumption, in other words, satisfying your wants. You just must make it mindful and take cues from your intuition when it tells you it's time to change the channel, as opposed to mindless self-indulgence. Indulging mindfully can bring you gratitude, empathy, insight, relaxation, and physical healing, but it won't have quite the same outcome on your well-being as engaging with things that satisfy or bring you closer to your spirit needs. Balance is one of the major keys to life. As long as you don't become consumed by them and they're not all you're living for, go ahead and enjoy your vices guilt-free. Aversion is attachment in disguise. Spending your life avoiding something is one and the same as spending it chasing that desire. And doing what makes me feel complete inside aids me in not clinging to and feeling guilty about the indulgences I have. I can enjoy them and let them go when it's time because I'm not using them to cover up the gaping hole in my soul. You don't necessarily need to be the poster child for health to have light flood your being and become effulgent. You just have to release the tension you have, the desire for more in terms of experiences and things, and the disdain you have for difficult circumstances which make you uncomfortable. Thus, we don't necessarily need a traditional meditation practice to bring contentment, healing, mental clarity, and insight. We can get them through mere conscious conduct or conscious consumption. However, though moderation and mindfulness are key, it's a lot more punk rock to not have any desires to begin with.
Hey guys and gals, welcome back to the Conscious Consumer Podcast, where we strive to help you thrive spiritually, mentally, physically, and financially in the digital age. Conscious consumption is essentially integrative health, incorporating how mind, body, and spirit are interconnected and impact our overall health. It's the understanding of how the things we consume, food and drinks, media, and resources, and the thoughts and beliefs that consume us all contribute to our overall well-being and the well-being of society as a whole. It's taking cues about what we need to be happy, feel fulfilled, and prosper from our inner pilot light or intuition and the natural world around us rather than material possessions or societal approval. It's the belief that everything is interconnected and the awareness of how our actions, intentions, and values as individuals and consumers affect someone on the other side of the globe we don't even know exists. It's the appreciation for strong community and how the sense of belonging to a tribe helps us prosper. It's the belief in the power of sustainability and local solutions over industrial approaches. It's the celebration of the DIY spirit and about making and spending money in a way that has the smallest social footprint. It's the belief in individuality and celebration of personal freedom and freedom of speech, so long as it doesn't affect the freedom and well-being of others. It's the understanding that in order to fix a problem, we must use our inner pilot light to learn and resolve the root cause rather than the symptoms recognizing that problems often stem from a failure to take personal responsibility for and measures to combat our poor decisions. For me, this last principle might hold the most significance of all of them. When I initially wrote it, it was specifically in reference to physical degeneration caused by a poor diet. But after much self-evaluation, I brought in the scope to transcend mere nutrition. Unbeknownst to me, lack of meaning and significance in my life was creating discontent, especially because I had set the expectation that I would do something significant with my life, making an impact on human suffering. The unfulfillment of my lofty goals, those which 99.99% of humans don't achieve, was creating disconnect. If I had to trace it back to one specific time, It was when I left my job and home in Chicago, where I had a more balanced life and felt significant, and moved to Mexico. It wasn't that I was unhappy in the new environment, it was more the fact that I lived alone, had no full-time gig, and didn't have the opportunities for leisure I had in the big city. I was relatively self-isolated and lacked the 